الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم to you all on this blessed day of Juma um, I have a couple of verses that I wanted to share with you all I'm very happy uh, to be here uh, in the Muslim space uh, community uh, and these two verses that I just mentioned I wanted to speak on, um, as usual, I'm going to request you all to sort of uh, engage and <clears throat> be willing to reflect alongside me as opposed to me sort of telling you or, or speaking um, down to you. This is really just me sharing some reflections with you, and hopefully you'll have some reflections to add and supplement what I share. So... Um, let me begin by reciting to you all a verse of the Quran uh, in Surah Al-Hashr. This is chapter 59, verse 10, wherein God says, and I'll recite in Arabic first, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ uh, And those who, came, who come after them, and those who came after them say, Our Lord forgive, forgive us and our brethren in faith, our siblings in faith, الَّذِينَ uh, سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Those that <clears throat> preceded us in bringing their faith. Those that came before us in uh, testifying or bringing faith. And do not place in our hearts غِل. Uh, and we'll focus in on this word غِل in a moment. Um, so do not place in our hearts غِل um, towards those who believe. And our Lord, indeed, you are ever gracious, most merciful. So غِل, the meaning... Uh, is sort of multi-dimensional, like uh, many words in Arabic. So there's an element of bitterness, which is how it's been translated. Uh, but you have other layers like hatred, envy, malice. All of these kind of are subsumed under this word ghil. Um, and in this dua, basically, that the Quran is sort of quoting people uh, that are making it, they're saying, don't make us, oh God, you know, remove this kind of resentment, any kind of malice, envy, hatred towards our brethren in faith from our hearts. Uh, you know, take us uh, away from that state. Now, I want to connect this kind of rich meaning of ghil now to another verse. Um, and then hopefully we can put the two together uh, and come to an interesting conclusion. Anyway, for me anyway. Uh, so this is Surah Al-A'raf. This is the second ayah or verse of the Quran I want to relate to you. Surah Al-A'raf, verse 43. And we remove whatever was in their hearts. Again, it's the same word. So we will remove whatever uh, is in their hearts of ghil. Uh, and then it continues. Rivers flow beneath them. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَ لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَا لَوْ لَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ uh, Praise be to Allah for guiding us to this. Um, we would not have been guided were it not for God, or were, were God not to have guided us to this. Um, and it continues, لَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُ رَبِّنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَنُودُوا أَنْ تِلْكُمُ الْجَنَّةِ أُورِثْتُمُوهَا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ um, so this is still them speaking. We would not have been guided had God not guided us. The messengers of our Lord had certainly come with the truth. So this is a moment when they've entered paradise uh, and they're saying that the messaging that, that had come to us from um, those that God sent has come true. Like the promise has been realized. We're in paradise. Um, and then it says, the verse uh, concludes with, it will be announced to them this is paradise uh, awarded to you for what you used to do. Um, so there's two snippets here that I want to kind of go back to now. One, the first verse we quoted from 
is a group of believers that's basically asking for their hearts to be purified from any kind of resentment towards fellow believers, particularly those that have come before them in bringing faith. And then this snippet now is really kind of a snippet of, of, of paradise where the people of paradise, it's concerning them, right? It's not so much the life of this world. And it begins by this segment of that ayah saying, we're going to remove from their hearts any traces of ghil. So any traces of what we were saying would be considered resentment, bitterness, envy, malice, and, and hatred. Um, it is almost as though is the, in the second you know ayah that we're almost seeing how the people of paradise are not plagued by these matters, you know, that their hearts are purified for them to be uh, har in harmony with the gift of paradise, you know, to be in harmony with the gift of paradise, this kind of resentment and hatred and all these things have to be taken out of you. Another interesting thing that I think this may imply also, and some of the translations hint at this, is that no traces of resentment will remain. Um, and that, or God will kind of remove all traces of resentment. So this kind of points to also the potential idea that, you know, we can do what we can to purify our hearts and clean our hearts of these matters, but it is ultimately only God that can really take the final bit of that encrusted resentment out of our hearts before admitting us into paradise. Um, the connection that I was trying to sort of make here is that, you know, we could reflect in a way, this kind of points us to reflect on how when we are free of many of these maladies that honestly tend to weigh us down more than the individuals that we have a lot of resentment and hate for, it tends to be heavy on us, that, you know, there is a kind of indication of, you know, preparing for paradise and even kind of living a kind of paradise on earth, you know. And of course, I'm not saying theologically we believe in that, but what I'm trying to get at is symbolically you approach or approximate that state that you would find yourself in in paradise and in many ways you can end up lightening your load in this life if you work on in 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 those um in that way on your heart that you become a person that really lives a life of lightness if you don't have much in your heart against anyone that's sort of repeating itself in your brain again and again and, not, and i'm not claiming that i've gotten there but you know that you just have a lot less on your heart and mind and indeed that's a kind of being in harmony with paradise and preparing ourselves for paradise so i thought that was just a very interesting connection um and one that i wanted to lift up um just another uh few thoughts that i want to share with you all on this and then you know maybe we can um stop and take some comments and, and ideas from you all um but this idea um this idea that um, there's kind of a dual uh, lesson that we can take. One is what I already mentioned, you know, more on an individual scale where you're kind of approximating to the state that, you know, we may find ourselves one day in heaven. Um, but also then just the lesson for our communities uh, in, in terms of community building. A lot of times when we start to work together and try to create something, there's like people rub each other off the wrong way. Um, people hold things against one another for long periods of time. And when that starts to take momentum, it gets really difficult to build anything productive or creative or beautiful on top of that. And so I think there's another element of these ayat uh, that are reminding us uh, that, you know, there's kind of an imperative to do that work partially because socially it matters a great deal. It matters a great deal for social cohesion. It matters a great deal for doing anything positive, constructive out here in the world. We really do need to cleanse our hearts often and forgive one another as hard as it is to be able to, um, to be able to productively build anything. So I think that was another community, uh, excuse me, just another lesson that would be geared towards a communal level more so. Um, and I think, you know, I think part of this in my mind anyway, connects to sort of, uh, efforts that many of us are making in terms of raising our voices, um, for, uh, the people of Gaza and Palestine. Um, and, uh, you know, all of us sort of come to that issue sometimes in different ways. Some of us are, you know, more activist oriented. Some of us are more educationally centered, some of us um, may uh, have uh, very difficult situations. We're working with 
uh, in terms of uh, the work that we're in. So we can't be as vocal as we'd like to be. So we're all kind of coming at this uh, at different levels. Uh, some of us are heavily involved in kind of economically boycotting, et cetera. Um, and some of us are just trying our best to uh, pray and have meaningful conversations with the small circle of influence that we have. And I think this verse would also perhaps speak to the fact that this is not a time for us to, um, you know, um, kind of critiquing one another and breaking one another down um, for what we are able to offer into this scenario, kind of um, offering critique in a way that's really destructive and kind of bringing each other down and discouraging as opposed to lifting each other up and being able to appreciate the different ways at which we're coming at this issue. But ultimately, inshallah, it's all a part of a puzzle, you know, a larger kind of jigsaw puzzle that when it comes together will, inshallah, deliver some kind of relief and ease to the people of Gaza and all oppressed peoples and you know causes that of are of a similar vein in which we 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 all want good for the cause said cause um but we come at it in different ways sometimes due to limitations other times um and just you know the kind of work that we're better at doing so I think that would be another place where it's important to not hold resentment and bitterness towards one another and try to center like when we do advise each other or challenge each other, we do so with care and ultimately with an intent to benefit the other individual. Um, and that requires us to work on ourselves and build our emotional intelligence, because if we do it in ways which um, otherwise could have been preventable, like there are certain conversations that are going to go bad either way but there are certain times when you grow to a certain level of maturity that okay I could have held that conversation with that individual to challenge them in a way that um you know if I if I if I approached it slightly differently it would have had a better result so there's a bit of responsibility on us to be thoughtful about the way we have these more challenging discussions the way we challenge each other um let me finally end on just uh, this narration, which kind of ties in. It's a story that perhaps many of you have heard, but, you know, it is a saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or narration uh, about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's always blessings in um, narrating these things. So I just want to conclude um, my portion of this conversation with, uh, with what's been reported. So <clears throat> it is narrated by Anas ibn Malik, May uh, God be pleased with him, companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We were sitting with the Messenger of Allah, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, a man from the people of paradise is coming to you, i.e. the Prophet said this. Um, a man from the Ansar came. So now imagine the Prophet, he's sitting with a group of his companions, and he's just made the statement that, by the way, someone is about to pull through that's from among the people of paradise, right? So now they're describing who this man was that entered in their presence. A man from the Ansar came, right, which was one of the tribes in uh, which which was a title for those people, the 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 Medinan Muslims, um, to put it simply. A man from the Ansar came whose beard was disheveled by the water of ablution, by the water of wudu, and he was carrying both of his shoes with his left hand kind of gives you an unimpressive picture, <laughs> you know, uh, of what these people are experiencing when they're thinking, oh, man from paradise is about to come through. Um, the next day, it said that the prophet repeated the same words. He again told them that a man from the people of paradise is coming to you. And the same man came, and he came in the same condition. Again, not a very impressive seeming picture. When the prophet stood up to leave, Abdullah ibn Amr, may God be pleased with, him, pleased with him, followed the man. So when the Prophet left the gathering, Abdullah ibn Amr decides to follow this man. Um, and he tells that man that, hey, I've been in an argument with my father. I, 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 I swore that I would never enter his home for three days. Can I stay with you? And so the man says, yes, you can. And so Abdullah stays with this man for three nights. Um, and he observes him and he notices that He's not necessarily praying at night. He never saw him praying at night. Whenever he went to bed, the man would remember God and rest until he woke up for, for the morning prayer. He's not really doing anything extra, ordinary, or, you know, kind of beyond the expected daily prayers. Um, 
And then Abdullah is also saying, Abdullah said that he never heard anything but good, good words coming from his mouth. When three nights had passed and he did not see anything special about his actions, Abdullah asked him, so there's nothing outward, you know, that he could really spot. So then he asks him, you know, O servant of God, I have not been in argument. I have not been in an argument with my father, nor have I cut off relations with him. I heard the prophet say three times that a man from the people of paradise was coming to us. And then you came. So now he's coming clean. He's basically saying, you know, that I kind of made up that story. I just kind of wanted to know what the prophet is talking about. Um, he continues, I thought I would stay with you to see what you were doing and I could and that I could follow. Um, so I was trying to see what I could see, watch you doing so I could imitate it, essentially. But I didn't see you do many good deeds. I didn't see outwardly you practicing something that I could take back and imitate. So then he asked him, why did the prophet convey this about you? And the man said, it is not but as you see except that I find no malice within myself towards the Muslims, nor do I envy anyone for the good that God has given them. Um, Abdullah said this. So now he's responding. This is what was conveyed about you. Like now I get it for we have been unable to do so. So in other words, you know, what's really, you know, what you're probably looking for is the fact that I hold no hatred, no malice in my heart towards any Muslims, nor do I envy anyone out there for whatever God has bestowed of favor on others. And then, you know, Abdullah is just admitting out of humility that we haven't been able to do that. We haven't been able to really rid ourselves of that. So I'll conclude with that and maybe with a short dua. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhaab al-nar. Allah, we ask you to bless us on this Jummah. We ask you to forgive us for all of our shortcomings. We ask you to bless our family members, those that we are in good relations with, good, those that we may be struggling with. We ask you to bring our hearts together on good. We ask you to be people that are courageous and wise in the way that we lift our voices for um, worthy causes of justice. And yeah, we ask you to alleviate the difficulties on the people of Gaza and all on the people that are being oppressed all over the world. We ask you to take care of us and take care of our young and um, give us tawfiq to uh, form a beautiful community that does not have any ghil, any kind of malice, hatred, and envy towards one another. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Ameen ya rabbal alameen.